in now. So I just want to welcome you back to Essex Wildlife Trust's second webinar for our urban wildlife champions and wilder communities. So I am Danielle Carbot, the Urban Engagement Officer at Essex Wildlife Trust, and I lead the Urban, Wild and Urban Wildlife Champions and Next Door Nature Project. So many of you have already met me or seen me at the first webinar session, on a site visit, a workshop, via Facebook or email. So hello and welcome back. Uh, just a quick reminder um, that this is a webinar and it will be recorded. So if you do miss some of it tonight or you have to dip off early, you'll be able to find it on our YouTube channel and I will send that around. If there are other people that you know that may be interested in a webinar, you will be able to send it across to them as well. Um, as it's a web webinar, you'll not be able to turn on your camera or microphone. But if you do have any questions, please pop them in a chat. There is a chat box there and I will try to answer them at the end. If I don't get a chance to answer your question today or perhaps you have a question pop up later in the week, uh, please feel free to email me. So, OK, I think that's everyone in and all the bits and bobs start started before I get into the actual webinar itself. So session two, as it says, will focus on wildflower meadows, something many of you are looking to create or manage in your green spaces and road verges. So just going to quickly talk about the word meadow itself, as it is banded about quite a lot and can mean different things. So for the purpose of clarity and before we get into the nitty gritty, when I talk about meadows today, I am describing flower rich grasslands. So grasslands, they can be separated into three categories, acid grassland, calcareous grasslands and neutral grasslands. In Essex, we often find our grasslands are neutral. So this will be the focus for our webinar today. However, for you guys, in most cases, your patch of grassland won't be in the best condition and unlikely to be flower rich due to the high nutrient levels in the soil. When we think about gardening, we often um, strive to increase the nutrients in our soil, adding feed or fertilizer. It is unfortunately the complete opposite for grasslands. So uh, when we describe a grassland as being improved, this is a negative thing because it means there has been nutrient levels um, that have been increased. Nutrients have been added either by feed or fertilizer. And so when we describe a grassland as unimproved, this is actually a positive thing because it means the nutrient levels are low. And that's really the aim of our webinar today, to look at management cycles to describe increase the nutrient levels in your soil. Now, I've just given a very quick overview there of the three different type of grasslands and what we'll be looking at today. And if you do want to take a deeper dive into the types of grasslands, because of course we are only looking at neutral today, Plant Life have some wonderful YouTube videos where they outline the different grasslands and the different types that you can find across the country. So the reason we're looking at grasslands today is because they can be found in our green spaces and road verges. So although I've just mentioned that in most cases they are not in the best condition, when managed correctly, they can actually support around 700 species of wildflower, an immense amount. So that can create a lifeline for our invertebrates, providing them with the essential source of nectar. A typical meadow can support nearly 1,400 species invertebrates, so beetles, flies, spiders, grasshoppers, crickets, butterflies and moths, you pretty much name it. However, as many of you will know, it's not just our green spaces and our verges that haven't got meadows. Our meadows across the country are in crisis and over 97% of our meadows have disappeared from our landscape. This is often in the pursuit to create neat and tidy road verges and parks. So they are often missing from our villages and towns too. We are all too familiar with the sight of grass cuttings sitting on our green spaces and road verges like mats. So I've got a few pictures here that I'm sure lots of you have seen in your towns and villages. And again, we're also familiar with the smell of grass being cut monthly or even weekly across the country through the summer months in particular. So why is that bad, you're thinking? So often this is done to create neat lines to ensure that our parks and our green spaces and road verges are kept tidy but unfortunately that mentality 
of weekly and monthly cutting of our green spaces and road verges doesn't allow our flowers to bloom or set seed for the following year. Mowing and leaving the cutting to rot on top, like that mat that I was just describing, not only suppresses wildflower growth, but can increase the nutrients in the soil. Wildflowers, so opposite to gardening, thrive in soils that are low in nutrients. So if soil is too fertile, wildflowers will face stiff competition from more vigorous grasses and plants that prefer fertile soil. Therefore, the number of wildflowers you will see in these areas will be greatly reduced. So if you have seen an area that maybe has been left to grow, you will notice that because over time the nutrients have been increased through this management, there will be maybe even maybe one or two wildflower species or in, in fact, maybe none at all. Um, you'll often find that meadow buttercup or red clover are the last ones that hang on. So it really is a delight, therefore, to know that so many of you are developing or launching projects that are focusing around the, the naturalisation of green spaces, creating wildflower meadows and changing mowing regimes. So to support you, I'm now going to go through some actions that will help you on your mission. Everyone across Essex will be working with different sites. So Although I'm helping you with the management cycle today, there's not one approach fits all. It really is to do with the area that you're looking at. So it's really important to understand how the area is already managed and by whom. These pictures here I've got on the screen are from different places across Essex and are spaces in which patches could, if changed management, um, could be managed as a meadow, encouraging and allowing wildflowers to grow, creating that essential habitat. Some of you I know on this webinar today have already picked areas very similar to these. So, for example, uh, top left, you've got an urban park, areas of which patches of wildflower could be encouraged. So you would then have that woodland habitat next to a grassland habitat rather than a mown grass area. This would create not only increased diversity, but a mosaic of habitats where a number of different wildlife species can thrive and live. Next to that photo on the right is um, a recreation ground with a playground. Um, edges or corners of these sites can be good for meadows too. Um, so although it's a playground and people will use these for recreational uses, it really is great for children to be able to in explore and interact with those sort of wilder edges as well. So choosing smaller patches also leaves space for that amenity grassland so people can still can continue to have picnics, enjoy the area during the summer. Um, you've then got middle left, uh, which is smack bang in the middle of residential housing. This is a grassy patch. Um, which is, to be honest, not used for anything and would be perfect for a wildflower meadow. Um, it would be great to link up, as you can see, there's two houses on each side, those gardens that pollinators will probably be already residing in and using. So it's connecting up landscapes. So um, it's not a recreational area and actually could be managed in a very different way. Um, again, bottom right, uh, you've got sort of a massive grass verge surrounded by houses and rows either side. So it doesn't get much footfall as um, not many people use that area. It is really in the middle of the road. So it'd be perfect for a meadow and would make that area look much more beautiful um, as well. As you can see, it is really just a big patch of green at this point. So just thinking to yourself now, are there any areas um, in where you live in your town or village that could be perfect for this sort of management? Is the area that you've already picked uh, going to be suitable? Because what you need is a patch of green, making sure that it's in an accessible area and possibly already in a sunny position. A few trees on the green patches is OK, but you don't want an area that's all, already pretty much a woodland. You do need that grassy patch that hopefully that you can then change the management um, to enhance the wildflower growth. Really, the options are endless. So things you need to consider once you've decided on your patch. How often is it mown currently? And if pesticides are used are key initial questions. So before making any changes to the area that you've picked, approaching the landowners and managers is your first step. In many cases, this will be your local parish or town council. 
Um, so share with them your concerns and visions for your green space or road verge. It could be via email, email, sorry, informal meetings or council meetings. Share the science with them and encourage them to see the benefits for wildlife. At this stage, you will have already had either a site visit with myself or an online chat. So I, I am really here to navigate this part. So don't feel like you are on your own at this stage. For example, I know a couple of people on the call today have already taken their first step. For example, we've got our urban wildlife champion, Daniel from Saffron Warden. He's currently liaising with his council to change the mowing regimes in a particular area of his local park. There's sort of four corners that are unused at the moment, um, rarely walked across and could be managed for wildflower meadows. And there's lots of families in that area as well. So the hope is that they can interact with that wildflower meadow, spotting the flowers, looking for uh, mini beasts. We've also got Donna on the call, I think, today in Hatfield Peveril. She's liaising with her council to change the mowing regimes on some local wide verges where the grass will be collected, as is currently not. And uh, hopefully this will promote different species of wildflower growth. One of those verges is right next to the local pond as well. So again, it's creating that mosaic of habitats where you've got linkages and connectivity. We've also got Angela, an urban wildlife champion in Wheelie, who's uh, liaising with her council to change mow regimes in a small unused green patch. Um, at the moment, it's just pretty much a thoroughfare with a dog bin in it. So they're looking at picking sections that can be left um, over the summer months so wildflowers can flourish. And then, of course, following that cut and collect management. So they're just a few examples. I know there's a lot more on this call today that are working hard to think of some uh, initial plans to create those wildflower meadows. But once you have um, sort of approached your parish council and had those chats, you've got them on board, you do really need to involve your local community. So if the green space in particular is surrounded by housing, knocking on doors is a great start to chat to people just to see what their initial thoughts are, their opinions. You might want to deliver letters explaining your vision or you might want to even have some listening exercises where you bring a group of people from that area together to do, just talk over the options. Um, if the green space is used regularly for amenity purposes, you could also even pop something into your local newsletter, newspaper or local Facebook page. It really is key to reach out to other people at this point, bring them on the journey with you, share the science, raise awareness of the importance of meadows and outline your plans. You may even find other people are keen to support and join you on your mission and you can start thinking about developing possibly a community group uh, to look after your patch, to monitor your patch, to survey your patch. OK, so that's the sort of, I suppose, more tedious part, the more uh, paperwork admin side of it. Um, but once you've set that up and once you've got those agreements in place, for your first year, the best thing to do is to actually just see what's growing. So it's quite an easy action from here on out. We're now obviously in July. So after your liaison with your council or landowner to stop mowing the patch, you're taking action on for the summer months. It's all about those observations. It really is so much easier to identify plants in the spring and summer months. And they can tell you a lot about the health of your patch. So going back to those neutral grasslands, if you've got high nutrient levels or low nutrient levels. So some plants on this screen here where I've given it a green tick, such as red clover, oxide daisy, meadow buttercup and crested dog's tail, which is the grass in the middle, are positive indicators your patch is healthy. So although that's only a few species, it can give you a really good indicator of whether the soils um, have really high levels or not. And in this case, it would mean that they're not too high and that to reduce those nutrient levels would be fairly easy. Other plants so on the other side of the screen where I've got that big cross, such as creeping thistle, broadleaf dock and nettle can be a problem in large quantities and are of a sign of increased nutrients. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to panic. It doesn't mean that your your project has come to a stop. It just means that the management cycle is going to be a little bit more intense for you. But they're not the only species that you might see that are a positive indicator. You might also th see things like common sorrel. So that's that lovely long red plant that you've got there on your left top left. 
Um, you will have seen this uh, probably in lots of different green spaces, but it's a really good sign that your patch is in good health. You might have agrimony, which is a really beautiful yellow plant, looks a little bit like ladies bed straw, so um, can be confused, but it's, it's a lovely one that starts to pop out in June. You've got cat's ear, which is one of the hawk bits. Now, hawk bits are very difficult to identify. Those were the, uh, at the workshop on Thursday will know this. Um, you don't need to necessarily know which hawk bit it is, but if you see one, it is a good sign. You've also got ragged robin, which you can find in damper meadows when there is um, some water present. These are such, such beautiful uh, wildflower species and can bring real colour to your patch. You've also got cuckoo flower, which is sometimes known as lady smock. Again, for damper meadows, uh, they tend to come earlier in the spring. You've also got knapweed as well, which often people can confuse for um, thistle, but it's got very different leaves um, and can create an almost purple sea uh, when they pop out in a meadow. You've also got sweet vernal grass, which is a really lovely sort of golden grass um, that sometimes actually people use for sort of ornaments in their house. It's got vanilla um, smell to it. You've also got the bird's foot trefoil, which is a low growing, lovely pea like plant. Again, another pea family plant, common vetch which you will see in meadows, a great sign of health. And then one of my favourites, Salad Burnet, which have got these really funky leaves and then sort of an almost lollipop top to them. Now, this is just a snapshot, uh, but there's some really good indicators and some common ones that you might see as you're looking at your patch and allowing it to flourish and grow. To support you spot these, so the negative and positive, positive indicators, Colin Austin, one of our ECOS ecologists, and I have created a handy ID sheet. So I'll send that to you within, with the follow up from this webinar in our next newsletter. Um, but it's a really great sheet that just goes through some really common species that you'll be able to use almost as a Bible. Is it a positive indicator? Is it a negative indicator? I've also put on there the Latin names, which can be handy when you're looking up other species or talking to other people about the species that you've, you've found. And it will also tell you uh, what grass then you'll find them in, whether it's calcareous, neutral or acid, and also if it prefers damp. Um, another thing that would be really useful and I would definitely recommend is this book uh, by Simon Harrop, A Field Guide to the Wildflowers of Britain and Ireland. It's got photos, which I found really, really helpful rather than drawings. And it shows you both the flower and the leaf, because sometimes the leaf can be really important to identification. So as you're doing this, as you're going through and looking at what species are on your patch, the best thing to do is to keep a record. Now, you might not know the name of all the species, so take lots of pictures, lots of videos. Um, and to elevate this, you might even get um, some of the community members around you to start helping you monitor the area. Maybe do a buy a bit splits day, get members of your community down on a Saturday or a Sunday, get them involved in that wildflower ID. And again, as you're taking all these recordings, as you're sharing your pictures with the community, um, share them via social media as well and local newspapers. Bring more people onto the journey with you, because when you share pictures of species that are on people's doorsteps, it really can create a sense of excitement. So, um, yeah, definitely uh, the best part, I think, of the management cycle, monitoring what you've got. Um, for more support with your ID as well, I know lots of people have found this useful. Our Essex BioBlitz campaign may also be of interest. So we have partnered with Essex University to understand the impact climate change has on our flowering plants through citizen science. So we're asking people across Essex to take pictures of flowering plants from April all the way through to September and then sharing them on an iNaturalist app. And there's just some instructions here on uh, the page I've got in front of you. What will happen is when you take a picture and pop it on the app, it will give you, it will generate ID suggestions. And although that's not always 100% accurate, it can give you a really good starting point to understand what you are looking at. And of course, it also contributes to our citizen science. So if you feel like um, taking a picture and then looking up the species that you found 
could be useful, this is one to definitely download. And you can find all the details on our website, so www.sxwt.org.uk. So, once you have left your patch to grow a little wild over the summer months, it is time to get stuck into management. Um, now, if you can't see this properly on the screen, not a problem, so I'll be sending this uh, around through the newsletter as a follow up. But it's a handy wheel that Plant Life have created and it shows you what actions to take each month. And it's just really, really handy, really simple way of, about knowing when to mow and when to leave it to grow. So whatever your findings over the summer months, whether you found that you've got lots of negative indicators, you've got lots of nettle, or you've got lots of broadleaf dock or creeping thistle, or on the other spectrum, if you've actually found that your patch has got some um, diversity of flora, you've found quite a few floral species on there, doesn't matter. This time of year, particularly in autumn and late summer, a meadow needs a cut. So you've left it to grow June, July, some of August, it's now time to cut it and all meadows need a cut. So you can either agree this with your landowner or council or you, you do it as a community group. It's completely up to you, uh, depending on the arrangements that you've made with the landowner in question. So do make sure that you've got that agreement in place. Um, it could be, I know some of you are interested in using the traditional scything technique as well. So whatever your arrangement, Cutting is one of the most important parts of meadow management. And alongside the cutting, so going back to what happens at the moment is when areas are cut, the cuttings are left. And as I said, that adds the nutrients to the soil, it suppresses the growth. So the key here is to collect the cutting. So either the council will already have the equipment in place, so they've got cut and collect machines, or if your plot isn't too big, as a group, you can rake the cuttings away. This is an essential part, I'm going to say it again, it's an essential part of grassland management and it, as it will really help to reduce the nutrients going back into the soil. So even if you have found a large variety of floral species, this is still really important so you can see those floral species next year. If though you do have a number of floral species, you don't need to be uber quick about collecting those cuttings. If you leave the cuttings lay, laying down on your patch for a week or so, it will let all those seeds drop off and go into the ground naturally. So that's only if you've got high level or floral species and um, that you can do that. If you found that it's just nettle, broadleaf dot, creeping thistle, then it's best to just collect it and take it away straight away. Now, if you have found that over your first few months that your meadow was dominated by those negative indicators, then don't panic. OK, there's no panic. In most cases, lots of you will find that. The first cut and collect is the beginning of your cycle. So don't reach for the seed packet yet. I know at the moment there's lots of advertisement about seeding up areas, getting wildflower seed packets, getting seed mixes for birds and butterflies but I would suggest not reaching for the seed packet just yet because you need to have a few cycles under your belt. I would suggest waiting at least one or two cycles before you put any seeds in because you will start to reduce the nutrient levels and perhaps see some other species arrive. If after your second cycle, you really are still observing low numbers of floral species and much of the area is still being dominated by those negative indicators. Still don't panic. This is the time to seed. So again, just to reiter reiterate, go through two cycles, one at a minimum, but two cycles before you seed. And if you do want to seed, if that's something you really want to do after your second cycle, it really is important to know what seeds you're seeding. So there are a few key things to remember that I'm just going to go through here. So when you buy a packet of seeds, just ensure that you know the contents. You can buy seeds now, seed packets now that just say wildflower seeds on the front. But it's really important to know that you know the contents, that you've got a list of species that are on there. And what you can do is actually match that to the handy ID sheet that I will be sending through. You don't want the wrong type of species in your uh, seed packet, particularly as some seed packets at the moment are 
are filled with non-native species. So you want to ensure that the seeds you're using are native to the UK. So um, they're the first two things, making sure you know what's in the seed packet and they're native to the UK. Also, don't be persuaded uh, to seed your area with annuals. So I've got a picture here, sort of a big no-no sign. Um, you will see pictures like this often where you've got a wild meadow that is just simply full of colour. So you've got cornflowers, poppies and other annuals. And although they provide a wonderful display of colour and they do look fantastic, um, as the name suggests, they will only last a year and will not improve the condition of your perennial wildflowers. So in a way, what you'll be doing is almost creating an artificial meadow for a short period of time. Moreover, increasing the number, number of annual mixes, um, increasingly, sorry, the annual mixes do not contain native species. So just be really careful about the, the wildflower seed packets you're buying. So if um, you do get to your second cycle and you've picked the right seed packets, it's got those native species in, they're not annuals, they're perennials um, and they are native. The, the most important time and the most sort of essential key time to seed those seeds is after your cut and collect, when you've raked away those cuttings and there is bare ground, because the bare ground is needed for those seeds to germinate on. So um, things like yellow rattle can be a really good species, nicknamed the meadow maker, um, to sow, simply because it's a semi-parasitic, uh, plants. It feeds off the nutrients in the roots of nearby grasses, which means the grasses become less dominant um, and therefore giving space um, for other wildflowers to come in. A particular thing to note about yellow rattle is the latest you can plant is November. Um, the seeds need to germinate before the winter months, before that cold snap, otherwise they won't last um, until the next season. So I know that's a lot to take in about seed packets. If you do need any support with seed mixes, please send over an email or if you've got seed uh, packets or mixes, take a picture of them, send them over to me. I can let you know if they are of good quality or if they're native or whether they're filled with perennial wildflowers or not. Just send over an email or, of course, give me a call. So um, the winter months. So we're still looking at that plant life cycle there. They are the easiest months um, and it really is as simple as leaving it alone. That's it, winter months. Um, then as we move back into the spring, um, an early cut is needed, especially at the beginning of your cycles. Again, for the cut, you can either agree with your landowner or council to do this um, or use the traditional scything technique. Again, it's key that the cuttings are collected either by the council who will have the equipment or as a group you can rake the cuttings away. So that's that's two periods. So the, the late summer and early autumn cut and then the early spring cut. Now obviously you do need to take seasonality into account um, and this wheel is really good here because it gives you a couple of months where mowing could be a potential um, but you do need to make sure that you're looking at the seasons as you go through, because you may need to cut a little bit earlier or a little bit later, depending on what's happened. I know this year, for example, it's going to be been completely different to last year. Last year, we had a very cold, wet, frosty spring, whereas this year we had quite a mild, dry spring. So there are some other things to take into um, account, but it goes round and round each year. So. Once you get into the hang of it, it can be quite easy. And for areas that are dominated by grasses and have little wildflowers present currently, it can take some time and a few cycles for the wildflowers to bounce back. But be patient, I promise you, your work will pay off. Okay, so there are some other things to consider when managing meadows, particularly if you want to encourage structural diversity. So if your meadow is big enough, or um, some of it can actually be left uncut after the summer months, not all of it, just little patches, um, which will provide a patchwork of diff different compartments, giving invertebrates somewhere to overwinter and can also provide seeds for birds. If your meadow is in a very urbanised area, putting in purposeful mown lines, a bit like the pictures on the screen I've got here, may give the impression of neatness, going back to the sort of that neat and tidy feeling. Um, if you are in an urban area, 
uh, where potentially you might have criticism or complaints, mowing in these lines um, can move you away from criticism and help people understand um, that this is purposeful action. Again, mowing in paths or borders or creating shapes to make it visually pleasing can really work in parks and amenity spaces too. Again, this also adds to the structural diversity. Um, so where wildflowers uh, can handle increased mowing, such as dandelion self-heal, self sorry, daisies, and daisies can thrive in those sort of edges and corners. Um, if you are raking up the cuttings yourself, there really is no need to dispose of them. They can actually be kept on site. So if your council don't have the cut and collect uh, equipment and it's a fairly small patch, not too large, um, they can be kept on the site in sort of mounds, which in turn will create further habitats for things like hedgehogs, slow worms or grass snakes. If you need guidance on where best to sort of keep your mound, to ensure it's not unsightly or in a, a place where it's going to cause problems, I can come and do a site visit and help you out, find out where the best place is. But it's a great way of bringing in uh, different habitats and can make it so much easier if you as a community are raking up the cuttings yourself. Some of you um, in areas where uh, the nutrient levels are really, really high at the beginning of your management, you may find that the grass does actually grow vigorously over the winter months. So it may need an extra few cuts. Um, on the other hand, as you complete the management cycle year after year after year, you may find your meadow only needs an annual cut in the autumn or late summer and you can start getting rid of that spring cut. So you'll find actually as you go through this management cycle, though it may seem quite overwhelming to begin with, it can become quite an easy process uh, where you don't need to take so much action because the conditions have been enhanced and the grasslands are unimproved. So that that um, that saying that sounds a little bit strange to the ear, but we want grasslands to be unimproved. We don't want high nutrient levels. We don't want it to act like a garden. Signs are also a really great way to inform your local community of your project um, and it helps spread awareness. There are some examples here on my screen um, and in some, case you're, some cases your, well, your council may want to work alongside you to create these, sort of making them a little bit more formal and fancy, but handmade ones are great too. So it's up to you how you want to go down uh, this route, you might want to get funding uh, to get some uh, signs made, or you know, you might have someone in your community that has the skills to create a sign, maybe to paint it on. Um, it all depends on what situation you're in, but do try and move away from laminating, laminating A4 sheets of paper, as these do disintegrate easily and the plastic can spread into the environment. So just think carefully about how you might sign up the space. Um, wooden signs in themselves are perfect, perfect as they can also become dead wood habitat for invertebrates to use too. So it's got sort of a multi-layer thing to it there. Um, some of you on this webinar today might also be looking at meadow creation in gardens. So encouraging neighbours to naturalise lawns, leaving wild patches or simply to mow less. Now for gardens, the principles are exactly the same. You can use the management I just discussed in any situation, no matter how small or big your patch is. However, you might find that people are hesitant to have a meadow in their garden and there are some ways you can sort of ease people into it. The first is no mow may. So I know that that has already passed this year, but it really is a great way to get people on board simply because May is the month uh, many of our wildflower species begin to pop up and um, the grasses haven't quite uh, got into their rhythm yet. So uh, the meadows in May tend to be quite short in their characteristic anyway. Species like dandelion, self-heal, creeping buttercup and bird's foot trefoil are quite low growing and do provide such a fantastic display of colour. And these species tend to be um, ideal for increased foot traffic as well and uh, will continue to grow even if the area is being used and walked on. Um, even after no mow may, these species can also be encouraged to flourish after the after that 
um, sort of end of May cut. If you just put the lawnmower to a slightly higher uh, cutting level, um, you will manage probably to keep the common birds foot trefoil, the dandelions, the clover, the self heel underneath that cut and then getting rid of the longer grasses coming through. So although, um, you know, in a perfect world, I'd love to see some fantastic uh, beautiful uh, tall wildflower meadows in people's gardens there is uh, some really good tips out there to sort of ease people in um, and hopefully get used to having uh, more than just grass in their lawn so the aim is to encourage wildflowers to flourish wherever possible okay so um i've gone through a lot of information there um and i am aware that this is a sort of an introduction to uh, wildflower management. So if you do feel that you have any questions in response to that or something that's popped up that you don't understand, please feel free to pop them in the chat um, because I have now come to the end of my webinar. Um, and I'd like to say thank you, really. Uh, thank you for coming on to the webinar. Thank you for signing up to be a champion. We really couldn't create a Wild Essex without you, and we appreciate each and everyone's contribution. And I know a lot of people on here have some fantastic ideas in the pipeline. Um, I'm so excited to support you with your Wildflower Meadow projects, um, and seeing areas of green space and road verge become transformed is going to be fantastic. Um, if you are at the beginning of your journey, it might be interesting actually to look at our Urban Wildlife Champions map, which can be found on our website. Um, I've just got on there some examples of what people are doing across the county. Um, and I can link you up with people who might be able to support you as they're already at the beginning of their journey. Maybe you can go and do a site visit with me, see how they've started uh, transforming their patch. So, yeah, questions, anything that's popped up, um, I'm happy to answer today, this evening. Or, of course, if you want to email them across, I'm happy either way. I'm just going to have a look at the chat, make sure nothing has popped up as I've been chatting away. Oh, uh, thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you, Watton. Thank you, Donna. Uh, I'm glad it was helpful. I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> Hopefully you can use some of that now in your projects moving ahead. OK, well, there's no questions. Doesn't look like there is. Then I can uh, leave you uh, to enjoy your evening. Anything else, do send me an email. Oh, thank you, Hannah. Ah, yes, some areas are very residential, so Absolutely. A walk around the neighbourhood to have a look at what patches are there can be a really great start. Because actually what you find is you tend to walk around your local area, your town, your village uh, with sort of blinkers on. You, you're in sort of pilot mode. So, yeah, sometimes just having a walk around the neighbourhood or inviting me to do a walk with you to look at those places that have potential uh, is a great start. I'm actually meeting um, the council in Saffron Ward and doing a walk around uh, with them to look at some potential sites. So absolutely do invite me to do that if you feel it might be appropriate or, you know, effective or, you know, helpful, whatever, whatever it might be. So, yeah, thank you, Kate. Thank you, Linz. Yeah, absolutely. I hope I hope the information can help you start identifying. If you have any, you know, questions about wildfly, wildflower identification, just let me know. OK, well, thank you, everyone. And I will I'll see you later. Enjoy your evening. Bye.